Okay, it's one o'clock, and uh, my name is Lisa Marie Blaschka, and uh, I am moderating the session today. Thank you, everyone who is here. We have a really packed group of people, and we've got a number of speakers, so I'd, I'd like to get us moving into the webinar uh, today, which is, <coughs> which is titled Ongoing Initiatives in Open Education Within the European Union. And we have, as I mentioned, we have a number of distinguished speakers today. Um, these speakers include um, Grania Knoll, um, Irena, um, well, Verena, I can never pronounce your last name, Valun, Valunke Raymond Hudak, Jochen Ehrenreich, Andrea Inamorato, um, Elena Cal, Cal, Caldirola. Rola. So we've got a number of people today here to uh, present on some of their initiatives, uh, very distinguished speakers from a number of different uh, areas of expertise. And so we're going to start out with um, Jochen Ehrenreich, who is a senior researcher at the uh, Dual Hochschule Bad, um, in Baden-Württemberg in Heilbronn. Um, he's built his expertise in fields like university governance, quality assurance and accreditation, lifelong learning, and technology transfer through hands-on project work at various institutions in higher education uh, and in continuous education. He has a master's degree um, in economics and business administration from the University of Witten, Herdecke, um, which is German's, Germany's first private university. And without further ado, I'd like to hand the floor over to Jochen so he can give his presentation uh, about the OE Pass project. So Jochen, okay. please go right ahead. Lisa, thank you for the kind introduction. I will present uh, the project OEPASS. The aim of OEPASS is to make online and open learning comparable and recognizable within higher education. To achieve this, we are developing a learning passport, uh, which is called the Open Education Passport. And we think that students in the future will be um, enrolled in their home university for the core curriculum, but they will select specialist courses online on, and from other education sources and will ask their home uh, universities to recognize those as ECTS credits towards their degree. So uh, that's why we are creating the Open Education Passport, um, which will create trust and transparency in uh, the credentials that uh, students uh, collected somewhere else. And um, <clears throat> I will share some of the preliminary results with you and take you right into what we are doing. <clears throat> so um, here you can see uh, the project partners. It's an EU-funded uh, Erasmus Plus project. And we have uh, uh, BME from Hungary. We have uh, the HBFW from Germany, Stifterverband from Germany. Um, we have Eden, we have Kick from Malta, DDM from Lithuania, Stifterverband from Germany, Tambora University, and UNED from Spain. Um, and um, this is the project overview. So first, we, were, we analyzed credentials in open education. Um, then we identified a uh, metadata standard uh, suitable for the learning passport, and we are developing the learning passport, and we are at the testing uh, stage right now. And um, <clears throat> uh, number three, I, I told already, that's the identification of the technologies. And uh, now four is um, uh, the procedures using ECTS for open education, because open education typically is not uh, denominated in ECTS, but rather in other um, in workload, in hours or days, and so um, we will develop. Uh, we are developing procedures for converting it uh, to make it recognizable in higher education. And the fifth intellectual output is uh, a look into the future, how the uh, future could look like. The current situation is that um, EU recognition instruments um, were created to enable uh, student mobility, but they were created to enable uh, physical student mo mobility and with uh, virtual mobility, um, they don't always provide what we need. So the 
EQF is not for non-formal uh, education. The diploma supplement is only for degrees. The ECTS is only for higher education. Other systems have other um, um, other currencies of learning, and um, the ESCO, European Skills, Competence, and Qualifications and Occupations database, is not used for higher education tools so far. So um, the challenge we have is, on the right-hand side of this table, that we, in virtual student mobility, we want to transfer credits from online and other non-traditional short learning programs, which might be offered not only by higher education institutions, but also by other education and training sectors, which are typically not higher education accredited, which are often not described in ECTS, uh, where identity ver verification processes and, um, and controlled assessment uh, is much more complex and challenging than in face-to-face -face settings, uh, where we don't have a learning ag agreement from the home uh, university usually, and where we don't have uh, as, uh, as much uh, transparency about the uh, academic con content and learning methodologies as we would have with a partner university abroad. So our solution is the learning passport, which offers specific advantages uh, to the student, to the higher education institution, uh, and to any open education provider. Basically, uh, we set out to create trust and transparency. Um, so the, learning, the student wants to display, accumulate, and transfer credentials or credits with the learning passport, the higher education institution, or the person or committee making the recognition uh, decision. They need sufficient information about the credential to make an informed and consistent decision on recognition of open learning as ECTS credits. And also the open education providers, they need to know which information they should provide in a credential and which requirements exist uh, so that their um, credentials will be recognizable. So we looked at liter literature, of course, and um, for quality criteria of credentials. Um, C1 to C7, so most uh, literature has some combination of those. So identification of credentials and institution that is issuing the credential, identification of the learner, learning outcomes, workload of learning, level of learning, quality of learning, assessment of learning outcomes or rules to earn the credential. So this is the transparency side. Most existing projects looked at assessing the learning itself. And we take a bit of a different perspective. We assess the, we look at the information content that the credential provides. And um, so we say a good credential must provide at least uh, information on all those points. And then we uh, identified uh, characteristics of a credential itself, of the medium. It should be distinct, authentic, accessible, exchangeable, and portable. And we, um, of course, uh, defined further what this means. Um, but I will not read it to you in detail uh, because of the time. So the next step was to identify a data standard for the learning passport. Um, and we found the uh, MicroHE uh, standard. Uh, uh, Raymond will present the MicroHE project, project after me and tell you more about it. So uh, the MicroHE project is developing a, or has developed a metadata standard on the European skills, uh, competences, qualifications, and occupations um, basis um, to make open learning recognizable. So they focus on the tech side, and we focus on the user side and on the procedure side of recognition. Using this learning passport, we, uh, uh, using this metadata standard, we created the learning passport which you can see here in small uh, print. 
and we are at the stage of testing it and revising at it and um, making it more concise and usable at the moment. And that is it already. So we have, I'm a bit ahead of time, so if you have any questions, but I could also pass over to Raymond now and to Lisa. Thank you, Jochen. Uh, we were planning on waiting until the very end, but since you did not use up all of your speaker time, um, I think it would be all right if we uh, answer uh, the one of the questions that's there, um, and Grania has gone ahead and answered it um, briefly. Um, is the learning passport also for lifelong learners? Yes, it, it will be for lifelong learners. You will uh, see more about it in Raymond's presentation on MicroHE. So the, uh, because the results we are generating at the moment will inform the next development of the Europass. And Europass foresees um, several um, types of credentials and this will also be lifelong learning. But the focus of, so we, it is possible, but the focus of OEPass is at the moment on higher education. Ah, okay. How do you compare Great. this to badges? So uh, open badges are too open uh, for the purposes of uh, higher education recognition. So um, what we are developing is um, supplementing uh, the landscape of credentials. So most open badges are not uh, you cannot be sure that identity is verified and that it has uh, controlled assessment um, conditions. So I would say open badges are a bit um, lower positioned and what we are developing is uh, with more uh, uh, stricter requirements. Okay. Ediko, is, who is part of the project, just posted a link to the learning passport. Okay, Irena has asked, um, who is the first target group for the results of OE Pass? The first target group is higher education students who want to make their um, or yeah, who want to make their learning uh, recognized by their home university. But to do this, of course, uh, the education provider would have to provide the credential in the form of the higher education, uh, of the open education passport. That is true. Okay. Great. Well, I think we're going to hand things over to Raimund. Thank you, Joachim, for your presentation. Uh, and Raymond, um, we're not able to see you in uh, the webcam. Uh, is it possible for you to enable your web webcam so that uh, the, the participants can see you? Okay, is it working now? Um, we aren't seeing you, but we do hear you, okay. so that's that's good. All right. Um, so my name is. Um, I can, I, I would like to introduce you first. Um, Raymond Hudak is the head of the research um, uh, research labs at the also at the um, Duale Hochschule Baden-Württemberg in Germany. Has more than 15 years of experience as a senior lecturer and researcher at leading academic institutions, uh, and has been involved in various research programs in Germany and abroad. His research focus is in strategic collaboration among stakeholders, students, institutions, and employers and the use of technologies for teaching and learning, as well as open educational resources, micro-credentials, and short learning program, programs as new approaches uh, to student-centered learning. He acts as a project manager uh, at his institution and in several European-wide research programs. He has an MBA in business and international marketing from the Institute for Technology and Commerce in Reutlingen, Germany. So, Raymond, uh, please go ahead with your presentation. You'll be talking to us, um, <clears throat> talking us today about uh, about the project that that Joachim mentioned before. So, please go right ahead. Thank you, Lisa, for the uh, introduction. 
Yes, I will talk about uh, the uh, project um, Micro HE, um, support future learning excellence through micro credentialing in higher education. The main project aim is to create a model blockchain infrastructure for storing and automatically verifying uh, credentials. So in addition, the project aims to provide uh, a comprehensive policy analysis of the impact of modularization, unbundling, and micro-credentialing on higher education in Europe. And uh, uh, the challenges for the projects are to gather the state of the art in micro-credentialing in Europe uh, at the moment. So this is one of the outputs. Then forecasting the impacts of continued modularization of higher education on higher education institutions. Then proposing a credit supplement to give detailed information about micro-credentials. And uh, this is the focus of my presentation now, proposing a metadata standard and developing uh, an online clearinghouse to facilitate the recognition transfer uh, the <coughs> and portability of micro-credentials uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, before I will uh, go into the uh, <coughs> we had a, a standard uh, and show you where we stand right now, I want to start with uh, this short uh, question. What is the value of qualification? So basically we can say the wide acceptance of degrees is as much a function of their technical value as of their inherent uh, value. So these are the questions we are asking ourselves. So we are looking at the traditional view of qualifications as we all know it from EQF 1 uh, to uh, 3, 4 on the VET side, high VET side advanced certificate 5, EQF level 5 and then on the uh, higher education side 7, 8, 9 um, and uh, 10. So Bologna has improved the technical quality of qualifications such as recognition conventions, qualification frameworks, diploma supplements, credit systems, but no common European format exists for describing qualification and the learning outcomes and this hinders their comparative comparability but digital tools have been uh, ignored. So that's uh, where we have our focus on in micro -age. The challenging idea as we see it is ECDS not qualifications should become the default unit of learning. A simple idea is to create a standard format for documenting micro-credentials in terms of ECDS using existing recognition tools. Uh, how to do it? Recognition conventions, extend principles of Erasmus agreement to overarching credit systems, or qualification frameworks, extend to capture descriptions of 2 to 60 ECDS, diploma supplements replaced by credit supplements, and the credit systems create the metadata standard. This is the framework uh, which we have developed uh, right now for digitally signed uh, credentials. So we are looking at qualifications, we are looking at, at course credentials, records of ex experience, certification of skills and the recognition uh, statements. You can uh, see uh, at the bottom of this graph the metadata uh, awarding body, uh, the credential owner, skills of learning outcomes, for example, uh, when we look at the qualifications obtained by the following uh, accredited course, certified by an mm, awarding uh, body, so here digitally signed qualification and self-certified claim of qualification with uploaded uh, evidence and then the uh, grades behind. Uh, then on the course credential side obtained <coughs> following a course certified by awarding body, digitally designed uh, credentials and the self-certified claim of course credential with uploaded uh, uh, evidence. Uh, records of experience, for example, obtained by employment, apprenticeship, volunteering experience or hobby, the certified by awarding body, digitally designed record of experience, also self-certified claim of expertise with uploaded evidence and the certification of skills is 
um, obtained by irrelevant at the moment, as we say, certified by awarding body, digitally signed confirmed confirmation of skills, and self-certified claim of skills. Um, here we now can have a look here into the first mock-up of this um, uh, blockchain tool. Here we can see the, uh, uh, the credentials uh, clearing house uh, on the uh, bottom left. We can see the different levels the, um, and uh, the views behind it, for example, administration view, institution view, participant view. So here we are looking at it from the three different uh, perspectives students, the higher education uh, uh, institute, or uh, uh, on the uh, provider uh, side. The next level is the clearinghouse uh, level uh, two on a um, uh, personal level. So here, for example, John Smith, you can see uh, what kind uh, uh, of courses he has, when uh, he has completed it. So that's uh, already the level uh, of uh, a student or uh, also of a lifelong learner. So here the same as Jovan mentioned before, we are not focusing on uh, in micro HE um, with uh, the technical development of such a clearinghouse or such a metadata standard on higher education uh, only in the future. This will definitely be something used uh, by uh, lifelong learners uh, post-graduation. The relevance of the project MicroHE, Bologna has improved the technical quality of qualification, but only at qualification degree level. Although EQF aims to promote flexible learning pathways and focuses on learning outcomes independently, and where the qualification has been acquired, no common arrangements exist, as we can see it for credit and transfer and accumul uh, accumulation for quali uh, qualifications related to EQF. And that's why uh, this project has been uh, developed. That's it from my side. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Jochen. Uh, Raimund, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Raimund. Um, are there any questions? We have maybe a minute or two to answer a, a question or two before we move on to the next speaker. Okay. Uh, I don't see any questions showing up in the text box quite yet. Uh, how likely is it that an EU blockchain uh, to enable such a system? Um, how likely is it possible that it would enable such a system, an EU blockchain? Well, we are not quite sure, but the, uh, the EU uh, the, has already uh, accepted this uh, framework uh, here on the Europass side. Uh, so uh, we are not quite sure if uh, this will be uh, accepted then later on as a blockchain uh, technology, but at least we made a huge step forward that they uh, will use our metadata standard as we developed it in MicroAG. Okay. Uh, Irena has a question. Um, if we talk on a program level, what are elements of micro segments that MicroAG is talking about? Um, so, so we are looking at, that's one of the outputs at various uh, um, uh, micro-credentials we said we will look at micro-credentials with ECDS points 5 uh, plus. So here we can definitely um, uh, exclude uh, some uh, uh, digital uh, batch batches. So we are looking into uh, short learning uh, programs um, and uh, various uh, other forms uh, uh, which are what we say at the level of 5C ECDS and plus. So we are looking at different forms of credentials uh, in this project. Micro-credentials, sorry, yes. 
Okay. Uh, James has a question, and I think we'll take this last one before we move on to the next presenter. Uh, do you think that things like e-portfolios or other uh, forms of assessment would be needed to help give coherence a narrative to learning in that kind of uh, dis disaggregated uh, open education? Um, well, we are not looking at that at the moment within uh, this uh, project. But this, when we talk about lifelong learning, mm -hmm. definitely uh, this will uh, happen at the moment because the main, as I said at the beginning, the main focus of this project at the moment is uh, to uh, deliver the most comprehensive policy analysis at the moment for the uh, EU here, that the policies are developed first and the meta standards are defined. And then we are quite sure that this will open up to all different forms of uh, micro-credentials in the future. So it's a, I, I would say it's a, a beginning um, of, a, of a new uh, arena uh, of uh, the, the, the acceptance and acknowledgement of micro-credentials uh, here in Europe. OK. Well, thank you very much, uh, Raimund. Uh, and thank you, Orna, Irena, and James for your questions. We're going to move on to the third speaker today, who is Irena. And I'm not going to butcher your last name again, Irena, who will no. be talking to us about the <laughs> about the Reopen Solutions Project, Open and Online Learning for Recognition. Uh, Arena has been working among leading researchers, methodology, speci methodology specialists, and policymakers in the area of distance learning and development in Lithuania since 1998. Um, she has a master's degree uh, in Lithuania um, and has been working at uh, Kaunas University of Technology as a distance learning, uh, or she spent 11 years working at the Kaunas uh, University of Technology as distance learning methodology, uh, methodology specialist and researcher. She has a second um, master's degree from the University of Liege in Belgium in pedagogy of higher education, uh, and also has a, uh, she defended her dissertation on designing distance learning, teaching curriculum quality, reflective assurance in 2008. Uh, she continued her research activities at the Tautas um, Magnus University and has been there since 2007 where she is the Director of Innovative Studies Institute and Associate Professor at the De Department of Education. Uh, Irena is a member of uh, different projects. She's uh, in FQL. I she's also part of ICDE. She's a research group project member, study program evaluation ex um, expert in La La Latvia, and she is also president of EDEN and the Lithuanian Distance in E-Learning Association. So, Irena, please Thank go right ahead with your presentation. It takes too long a little bit to do this introduction, but actually, uh, why we put Reopen project on Open Education Week in Europe? Uh, because it is a solution uh, that has been developed in order to find the, the illustration, I would say, of the front end. If I compare to the two previous presentations, I could say they might be also talking about the back-end solutions, as programmers say, because they already talk a lot about the details and metadata and standards and new solutions in the infrastructural development. So Reopen actually was the project that addressed the communication uh, that uh, was published in 2016, a study from a GRC on the validation of non-formal MOOC-based learning. So at that time, uh, the study came out, uh, the problem has been analyzed for some time already among uh, the consortium partners that you see in this slide. And we thought that, yes, with this study and with the recommendations that are published there, we are ready to take the challenge and to go to address uh, the priorities in the opening up of education and uh, help um, institutions to collaborate and to meet the challenges that they have in terms of how to open curriculum through open educational resources, MOOCs, open collaboration, communication, and uh, what is most important in recognition and validation of non-formal open learning. We put the task to, to try to find a solution and example through the project where higher education with a formal education 
uh, non-formal education uh, through the companies, adult learning organizations, uh, CVET organizations, and employers meet and agree that we recognize each other's work and we recognize achievements uh, through open non-formal learning. So, uh, in reopen, uh, we plan to establish validated open learning practices for all these three uh, categories of uh, players and stakeholders to offer learning credentials for open and online learning curriculum, but we limited our choice. By then, we didn't have OE Pass, we didn't have micro higher education, we didn't have other nice projects. So we limited ourselves with the verification of learner identity, uh, setting learning agreement and other instrument for learner identity and authentic authentication, and uh, agreeing on the learning outcomes that are going to be recognized. And we also apply digital badges for recognition of learning uh, achievements. Um, today we would call them micro achievements. And of course, as well for uh, negotiation and the validation of the learning path. So, uh, given this context, I already jump to a solution that you can also actually reach now while I am presenting. So, uh, the solution is in several formats. Uh, the first is the website reopen.eu that actually introduces the key concepts agreed. What is validation? What is recognition? What is open learning? And who are the stakeholders in this triangle? The second format goes in the form of training material. We have three training material that are available now for anyone. Uh, you just need to register and you uh, access it and you can use it in your institutions. So the first one uh, is uh, on how to design non-formal open learning curriculum. So what uh, the description of the curriculum should appear. There are templates, there are examples that you can download and use. The second one is the training material of application of digital badges. How to create a badge, how to exploit it, how to use it uh, for different scenarios that you need for open learning, non-formal learning and recognition. And the third one, which was challenging, interesting, but now I think most one of the most useful results is a recognition of non-formal open learning results in formal curricula. So that was the, the target. So to establish the link, the match, how formal, non-formal curricula, and then employer needs it can be um, linked together. Uh, we thought it is important to ensure this link uh, from the very beginning, from the conceptual point of view, but also until the, the very last moment when the curriculum or the course, whatever you may call it, is published online as an offer and demonstrates this link evidently in the description. So you see um, uh, it in the example in the slide, but also if you go online at reopen.eu and select any course uh, suggested, you will see links in, in all these courses. Uh, the platform that has been established and has the concepts, training material, courses, and also the system itself, we use the Moodle system, of course, and, and elaborated it with the, the requirements that have been highlighted uh, during the development of the concepts and training material on how to implement that. Is also established as a solution, a very simple one, I would say user-friendly one. Uh, and when we talk with employers, with the uh, higher education representatives from study departments, faculties, and at the same time with non-formal education providers, it is much easier to talk on the interface level, on the front, uh, uh, front end level, I would say, so that they recognize immediately the elements that are familiar. So for the first uh, uh, agreement, for the first negotiation, I think uh, that is a good example. So again, everyone can uh, look at the platform, download it, use it. They just need to fill in the form and request it. Uh, 
So institutions, consortia institutions, I start with my university specifically as an example, adapted the, the, the ICT platform, adapted solutions and created on, online uh, non-formal learning offers uh, for their needs. What is important also, very important I, I would say, is that we also have cases that have been established during the pilot phase of the open project. And the cases demonstrate how the, the three stakeholders negotiated and reached agreements in terms of recognition of open and non-formal learning. But also one interesting element, I just um, had also experienced some good discussions from um, uh, international events that I presented this project in, is that teachers themselves become um, better uh, conscious about entrepreneurial skills. They become stakeholders themselves. They develop their offers. They are involved in the process and uh, track uh, it from the beginning until the end, realizing how important credentials are, how important agreements are, and that they can uh, increase their entrepreneurial skills. But you will see badges here, learning outcomes, credentializations items, and testimonies from teachers, from education providers, formal or non-formal, and for, from employers online. So time is short, I prepared for short presentation, but if you have any questions or interest, the link is here and I'm also uh, here available to discuss it in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Irena. Uh, we do have a question from Orna, which uh, I'd, I'd like to pose to you before we move on. Uh, what learning design model are you using for the non-formal learning um, training course? Uh, I will ask you what specific, uh, uh, what do you mean learning design model? But if you think about curriculum designing uh, models, then uh, naturally we use uh, uh, dimensions that are important for all curriculum designing elements. So first of all, it is uh, triple consistency on uh, starting with the learning outcomes or competencies defined, and then in integrating all elements that are important uh, for open learning uh, uh, in terms of resources, also openness of activities, collaboration, and uh, inviting of stakeholders. But then um, we have a lot of other elements like digital cre credentials in this case, uh, digital badges and other things. So what I see, the, I'm the sorry, I don't know of what learning is design, uh, from Grania, she, uh, who wrote a book about, about that. She'll, she'll, uh, sorry, Grania, I don't know your, your, your invention. She'll go, she'll go into that, I think, uh, in a little more detail in her presentation. So. Um, let's uh, move on to the next uh, topic, the next speaker today, who is Elena Caldirola. Um, Elena will be talking to us about open education in Italy, challenges, opportunities, and perspectives. Uh, she's had 12 years of experience in e-learning, um, is at present in charge of the Head of Innovation and Didactics and Digital Communication uh, Unit um, and, at the, and, coordinator, and coordinator at the University of Pavia in Italy. Um, it works on a number of different projects uh, within ICT and education, for example, projects on blended learning, digital corporate training, learning space development, LMS platforms, um, multimedia and MOOC development, online courses, and virtual and uh, mobility exchange. She's an author and a co-author of many, many articles and contributes uh, to these topics within Italy and internationally. Um, and she is at present a member of the Eden Executive Committee. So Elena, please go right ahead and uh, begin your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa, for your kind introduction. Uh, I was uh, asked here to uh, try to represent uh, the uh, Italian situation ongoing uh, in the field of uh, open education. So I tried in this day to have a look uh, uh, at various uh, documents, uh, situation, uh, institution, and to have interview with many friends uh, in Italy that are in the field of open education, just to have an updated situation uh, in Italy. Because we had uh, uh, in different years, uh, different survey and uh, discussion about the state of the heart 
of uh, open education in Italy. And in this slide and in, in this short presentation, I tried really to, 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 to put in evidence uh, what uh, I have discovered in this way. So going on here, I can step to the second slide. First of all, I really uh, like to put in evidence uh, which is the European Commission about uh, the definition of open education. I particularly like it because it put in evidence uh, the main concept about the importance and the end view of open education and uh, above, all, above all about perspectives, opportunities, uh, uh, strategies uh, about uh, the advantages that open education can carry in a higher education system and in schools. So, uh, highlighting uh, the concept, uh, the main driver for sure will be the digital technologies and the scope is to widen access and participation to everyone by removing barriers and making learning accessible, abundant and customizable for all. And I really think that the previous European project uh, shown in the previous presentation just go in this direction. And it offers, of course, multiple ways for teaching and learning, building and sharing knowledge. It also provides a variety of access routes to formal and non-formal educa education and make connection with all these variables mentioned here in this slide. So I really think that uh, with the presentation of uh, Jochen, Raimond and Irina, we can really uh, revise and rethink about this definition of European Commission and think about that all these elements were uh, touched and improved. Of course, here I cannot avoid to mention the schema of Andrea Innamorato dos Santos about the 10 dimension of open education, of which six are uh, the core uh, situation inside the circle, the circle and four the transversal one. So we are talking about for open education about the field of strategy, technology, leadership, and quality. So going ahead uh, uh, now with this uh, very short framework about uh, the concept and the frame of, of, of open education in Europe, I will try to design and to talk about what is going on in Italy. The key drivers in Italy, first of all, at the policy level is for sure ICT that is uh, mentioned in a different official document from the ministry and from the Italian Conference of Rectors. Of course, so we are moving in four different and main fields, with the production of open educational resources, the production of open educational practices, the production of massive open online MOOCs, and not about production, but about leading, improving, and enlarge the movement about the open access. So, um, how can we uh, face with this uh, different dimension? For open educational resource, both in the school systems in Italy and uh, in uh, universities, we have different um, experiences, but at institutional level, where in uh, open educational practices, we have uh, a, a lot of experience in the university, above all about when we are speaking in a flipping, flipping classroom experience, uh, where in the schools uh, we are talking about uh, uh, practices from uh, teachers uh, who are enrolled and registered in different online uh, situations that I, I am going to show in the very next slide. For sure, we can say that uh, in Italy, um, regarding the open education, the very strong sectors uh, is uh, given from the production of MOOCs uh, in uh, different shapes, with different strategy level, with uh, different ideas, with different portals, with different kind uh, of approaches, and we are going to talk about it. Open access uh, are, um, is a, a movement uh, regarding, above all, uh, open libraries, digital libraries, and uh, um, generally speaking, um, the libraries uh, uh, of uh, all the universitarian system that want to produce and access freely research for researcher and generally speaking for all the people in Italy and above, uh, out of Italy to um, search and retrieve um, the result of the research. So are the four key, main key drivers in Italy for open education. 
two main, um, uh, how can I say, uh, evidence, uh, two main uh, conferences and two main uh, events were organized by the Conference of Italian University Directors about open education. The first one was a national working table uh, about uh, MOOCs in which, uh, um, as a group of university called there, we were able to write down uh, best practices, uh, rules, and a sort of document and uh, regulamentation in order to foster this movement of production of MOOCs and in order to give to the un Italian university uh, just uh, um, a shared um, idea on how the Italian university system could move in order to produce MOOCs. We are in lack of some uh, situation in Italy that is uh, in, a, in, a, in a lack of a, of a general and a strategy and, a poli and policy design in a how to move here or there uh, in, a, in, a, in the production of MOOCs. And with this action of the Conference of Italian University Directors, we tried to give a guidance of the movement in this direction. The second main event in Italy uh, was in uh, Udine, uh, University of Udine, 27 and 28 June, in which uh, the rectors organized eight different working groups, putting their in pair. In fact, you can see here the eight different working groups paired two for two. So we can read. Uh, this kind of uh, twinning system, and the first one is the digital factor as driver for innovation in didactics, teaching and learning digi for uh, digital technologies for teaching and learning. Uh, the second pair is maps of platforms and their interoperability, and technological infrastructures and cybersecurity. The third pair uh, is uh, MOOCs challenges and opportunities linked with open access, digital libraries, and big data. And finally, uh, the, the last uh, pair of working group is resources and action to support the digital university in the European framework and knowledge, certificate, and credit. So, uh, which was the final result of uh, the work of, of these eight working groups. This is the Italian scenario. We have in Italy these different main uh, um, opportunities around MOOCs. The first one, EduOpen, is a general portal for MOOCs organized by a network of Italian universities made by 19 universities that is, this group is growing and growing again. Uh, and they are uh, in, the, in the field to um, product and publish together MOOCs for open education to have an idea about how to recognize this MOOC in the uh, ECTS uh, system and uh, to how to recognize in non formal education with badge. Then we have other situations like the University of uh, Polytechnic of Milan and, and University of Bologna who made their own uh, platform in order to um, release uh, MOOCs, uh, the, the one of Milan is a POC that is uh, um, open knowledge, Polytechnic for open knowledge, and the name is Bridging the Gap, that is the idea to help students in uh, bridging the gap between one kind of degree and one other kind of degree when you have the progression in your career, and this is another idea. Then we have Federica, a portal uh, who, grow, who, who was born about the fact to publish in the first uh, step OER and now in the second step as MOOCs, but from the University of Naples, who want, the, the, um, who want um, to, to, to have also other kind of partner um, coming from uh, Italy and um, out, out there. And uh, uh, another kind of other um, initiatives are from the University of Turin, uh, Turin for their student. Um, this is uh, above all for guidance uh, um, for the student uh, in their university careers. And these are uh, the main uh, um, realities in Italian scenario. 
Here are uh, another about the school, just a couple of minutes again, uh, Lisa. <laughs> um, some uh, uh, representation from um, the landscape of the school in Italy. So we have different kind of uh, platform in which we have the possibilities for school to share, to produce, publish and share open educational resources for students. And the main uh, um, initiatives at the national level was the national plan for digital school, in uh, which the ministry try to uh, support the uh, open education, above all about to spread ICT in uh, uh, Italian schools. Just uh, to finish, some point to remark. Uh, we are for sure not lacking in uh, single initiatives for group of universities or single university who want to produce, uh, to produce open educational initiatives, and this is very good. I, I can say that in uh, one uh, aspect or other aspect, the main, um, uh, uh, the most of the university in Italy are involved in producing MOOCs. Even if I have to say that MOOCs is not representing at uh, 10% what is uh, the open education, but in Italy at the present is the most movement for uh, producing open education. Uh, so, uh, we are lacking uh, from the other end of strategies from the point of view of ministry, from the point of view of lacking of policy. Uh, so, we have such kind of problems in order to make and understand to the teacher, to the professor, the importance to uh, afford such kind of a movement for students um, and for a, a democratization of the, uh, of the um, education in our country. I can see here a lot of opportunities because anyway uh, the movement is growing, is growing and is growing again. A lot of university and the professor are producing MOOC in Italy and we are trying uh, as a final uh, result and final consideration of this sort of presentation to find out the uh, right business model in order to uh, share and have a good practice for all the university, not school, I, I mean here university that is a higher education institution in order to support and to foster uh, this uh, movement. And I think that I am uh, out of time. Thank you very much to Lisa for <laughs> some minutes after also the 10 minutes. And many thanks and many, many greetings from the University of uh, Pavia. Thank you very much. If uh, you have uh, any questions, uh, I am here available for you. Thank you very much, Elena. There are some questions that have been emerging in the chat box. You may want to join there. And we'll also be uh, addressing more questions after the final speakers have presented. We have two more speakers here today, Andrea and uh, Grania. Um, I'll first introduce Andrea, who will be talking to, she's from the European Commission, and she will be talking to us about the guidelines on open education for academics, how we modern, modernize higher education uh, using open education practices. Um, and uh, just to give you a little bit of background about Andrea, as Elena mentioned, she is one of the authors of the Open Education Framework, the 10 Dimensions of Open Education. Uh, she joined the J J JRC in September of 2013, and her role involves research and policy support on ICT for learning skills and open educational resources. Uh, her work contributes to finding opportunities and challenges of ICT and OER implementation at a policy level to innovate and moderate, uh, modernize uh, teaching, learning, and training practices in Europe. Uh, her current focus is on the promotion and update of openness in higher education, institution, and member states of the EU. Andrea has a PhD in education um, technology from the Open University of the UK and a master's in research methods for educational technology <clears throat> For also from the OU. She's a Master in Linguistics and Literary Studies in English Language at the University of Sao Paulo uh, in Brazil, and she's worked as an OER researcher at the Open University um, for many years, 2006 to 2011, and has been involved in many other OER and ICT-related research projects in the UK as well as abroad. So, Irena, let, uh, Andrea, sorry, I'm missing up everybody's <laughs> name today. Andrea, let me just pass this over to you, and uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, can you just please, you can hear me well? Yes? Okay. 
Great, yes, great. So, hello, everybody. Um, uh, good afternoon to all the presenters and everyone who is uh, watching us online. Uh, my goal today is is just to kind of do a sort of update on the work uh, we are doing right now with regards to open education here at the JRC, and try and explain how we've been building upon all the work we started back in 2016 when we published the 10 dimensions of open education within the report called Opening Up Education, you know, and try and explain how we keep on trying and uh, we are succeeding to, to keep open education in the main agenda of the European Commission. Um, so, um, today I'm going to focus on the new work that we are going to publish very soon because uh, um, I've just heard last week from Directorate General Education and Culture that uh, what we propose has been accepted, so I have an okay to go ahead and, and publish. And it is going to be, uh, it is uh, called Practical Guidelines for Open Education for Academics. I'll show it to you in a second. But before I talk about that, um, I wanted to, to try and, and build up in, in, in this idea. No, because we started in 2006 focusing on uh, opening up education for higher education institutions. And that's when, together with many stakeholders, we came up with the, with the definition that our colleague Elena just read, um, just discussed in the previous presentation. And we came up with the idea of the 10 dimensions because we really wanted to make the case for open education going well beyond, beyond open educational resources and MOOCs to include a number of, uh, of actions that would require a mindset shift from academics, from learners, and from educators to be able to, for us to be able to make it happen, to open up educational practices. No? So that report was focusing on um, institutions, let's say, uh, rectors, uh, vice rectors, faculty deans, That's, that was our main goal, you know, to, to obviously the audience is much broader, but we were thinking our discourse there was for, for that type of level of institutions, um, of, of staff of institutions. Then. Following that up, we came up with a new research project, also very comprehensive because we studied the 28 member states of the European Union. Uh, and we did a study on policies, what sorts of policies on open education we have at a national level. So we inquired um, academics, we talked to ministries of education, ministries of culture and science, and we published a couple of reports. Uh, um, some of them, uh, one of them, which is the technical report, presents the case study for each country of the EU on how exactly they had been perceiving the concept of open education. Um, and, and the report that we call more political, let's say, which is the going open one in which we place, we have made policy recommendations for the European Commission itself and for member states. So here we have then two dimensions, no? the institutional level and that a policy level, a ministerial level, more let's say broad perception of open education. And then we realized that in, we needed to do more to help foster open education, but this time from the bottom up, no? because we've been working on from the top down and then we were thinking, how about making it let's say easier, you know, because we have been, some of us here, uh, have been working on this field for many years, but there are new academics, people that are just starting, or people who actually don't know exactly how to go about open education. No? So they, very often they will focus on OER because it's easier, let's say, to understand, or they will, they will have heard about open access, but they won't have, let's say, a broader perception of how to go about open education with regards to the, all those 10 dimensions that we've been talking about since 2016. So we proposed to the Directorate General Education and Culture of the European Commission to the Department of Higher Education that we wanted to do uh, to, to develop a guidelines for academics, but practical guidelines. Okay? So we went back to the 10 dimensions uh, and we developed practical guidelines based on those 10 dimensions, but we try to be more didactical, okay? And this is uh, about to be published. It's, it's now under um, design. I've just lost my, my connection here. Just a second, please. 
I lost my screen. Okay, I'm back. Um, and it's it's. I hope that by spring this year we are gonna have it out. So. This is with response to the Digital Education Action Plan, which I mentioned uh, in, this, um, in this PowerPoint. It was published last year, the Digital Education Action Plan. And there is a whole section on open science, but we thought that open education, as we perceive it, really is transversal to most of the actions uh, that are proposed by the Digital Education Action Plan, and not only open science. So obviously, within the, within the framework of the 10 dimensions, open science is dealt with um, within the research dimension, no? But everything related to, to digital competence and to open education and practices as a whole is actually transversal to the proposals of the Digital Education Action Plan. So, we understand that open education is becoming increasingly important, and this is why we'll, we'll keep on trying and, and, and make it appear again within the, the agenda of the Commission. We know that the Commission is going to have changes now with the President of the Commission changing and all the Commissioners, and we are now preparing and proposing work for the next five years, and we obviously are tapping into uh, uh, open education. I'm talking, when I say we, I'm talking about the JRC, the Joint Research Center specifically, but the topic is, is still very much in the agenda, particularly now with the discussion of the recognition dimension, which has been growing. Uh, Irina has just mentioned the reopen project, which is focusing on the recognition dimension. The previous speaker to Irina was also talking about blockchain and credentials, which in our view is also placed within the recognition dimension. So it seems that we are now exploring open education within these different dimensions. And for us here, and particularly for me, it's an agenda that I really push forward. The ultimate outcome that we can have is to have open degrees. And that's something that we would really like to see happening. You know? Because if we have content available as OER, if universities are starting practicing more open educational practices, why not make syllabi more flexible, credentials more flexible, and have joint agreements to be able to offer full degrees to open learners? It may be still falling within the formal education uh, uh, aspect but um, of education. Not uh, So this is what, what, what we mean. We are bridging, no, try and bridge non formal with formal learning. So that's why we keep thinking that this would be the ultimate outcome and we'd like to see that happening. And we think we have this opportunity now with the new initiative of the Commission, which is the European Universities, which is pushing forward more collaboration between institutions. And it's within that context that we'd like to, to propose uh, um, experiments with open degrees at an EU level. Now, very briefly about the the guidelines, I just I cannot show you the details of the guidelines simply because it has not been published. But just to give you an idea, what we do there. So we go back to each dimension. And we this time we talk about the main concept, no? So for example, what is OER? Then we talk about the benefits of OER at four levels. We are focusing on the academics themselves, then for learners, what are the benefits for learners, for institutions, and for the society. So we are really trying to cover these four dimensions. But then I went beyond talking about benefits and we also talked about challenges, no? Because everybody says, oh, but it you know, the way um, the commission sometimes presents open education is that it's easily done and we know it's not. There are challenges and this time we are focusing on the challenges as well. What are the challenges for academics, for institutions, for society and for learners to use and to understand open education resources and we do it for the 10 dimensions of open education. Once we discuss the benefits and the challenges, then we present some statements for reflection. Uh, and and it really is on the line of the digital competences frameworks that we have. Uh, we would really like to see academics self-reflecting on their practices. So I'll just give an example. And, uh, and then I think I'm nearly done with my time. I'm not really sure. Uh, but just to give an example and how we have built it on a progression level, OK? So we have, for example, the first statement for reflection is, um, I choose to publish my content. You, I, I'm not sure you can read it. Um, let me see. Yes, you can say, uh, I choose to publish my research in open access journals. No, that's not OER. That's, sorry, just a second. I want to read OER because we are almost familiar 
with the OER. OK, so here we go. Try and follow the progression model with me. I can identify the license of an educational resource. If you are an academic, so that you will know that you can use that resource openly. Yes or no, and a brief explanation. Again, self-reflection question two progressively becoming, let's say, a bit more complex. I openly license the education, educational research materials that I produce. OK? Yes or no, and some explanation for self-reflection. Then number three, a bit more complex. I appropriately reference the OER that I use, whether I change them or not, and then some explanation. OK, and we have only five levels for, for each one of them. Um, so this is something that I cannot, I cannot go through in details, but I just wanted to say that by creating this tool, we hope to help academics at an individual level to change their practices, but also to prompt changes in their institution because they are key players, they are change makers. We'd like to see academics being ambassadors of change, and we thought that creating a, a practical guideline for self-reflection that is easy to use, that can be used for all dimensions or for specific dimensions, could help towards fostering open education. Now, I think I'll stop here, and, and I'll just say that we are also rebuilding a, a GRC website for open education, and that we will very soon release also two other reports on the continuous professional development of academics. OK? That's also planned to be done uh, this spring. That's, okay, that's all for me. Thank you, Andrea. We appreciate the input and the uh, insights of what's happening at the EC in terms of open education practices for uh, for uh, higher education instructors. I'd like to move on to our last speaker today, who is uh, Grania Canole, who is head of the Open Education Unit within the National Institute for Digital Learning uh, at the Dublin City University. Uh, before this, she was a consultant and visiting professor at Dublin City University and has worked at five other universities, Bath Spa, um, Leicester, Open University UK, Southampton, and Bristol. Uh, her research interests include the use of technologies for learning, open education resources, massive open online courses, new approaches to designing for learning, uh, e-pedagogies, uh, e and social media. Her particular area of specialty is the seven C's of learning design framework, uh, which she published in her book from 2016, um, and, uh, which is used to help Practitioners make pedagogically informed design decisions in order for them to make appropriate use of technology. She served on lots of editorial boards and uh, has developed many special issues. Um, and Grania will be talking to us and reflecting on the impact of the open education movement. Go ahead, Grania. Thank you. That's so great. This is just to give you a bit of an outline of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to draw on a recent report uh, that Mark Brown and I did for an organization called EENEE, -E -E, which gave a kind of overview of digital technologies and their impact on educational outcomes. So that's the kind of outline of where I want to go. And going back to the chat, I will be talking about not only the 7 C's framework, but some of the other frameworks as well. <clears throat> So a really seminal report uh, from OECD in 2015 made the following point, that ICT has revolutionized virtually every aspect of our lives, and students need to be engaged with it to participate fully in the economic, social, and cultural life. There are challenges, such as information overload, issues around plagiarism and online risk, and of course, privacy and, and risk is becoming increasingly important. Students need to become critical consumers of internet services and electronic media and make informed choices. So if you haven't seen that report before, I can thoroughly recommend uh, reading it. It's a really feminine report. So that kind of uh, was the backdrop um, for our, our recent report. <clears throat> we also drew on the work of P from the States um, on the affordances of digital technologies. And I know you can't see that diagram very well, but <clears throat> Pete talks about four phases of technology development. The first is cultural, you know, speech, for example. The sec second is the development of symbolic uh, communication mechanisms, words, um, uh, symbols, uh, uh, numerical numbers. 
Uh, the third is communication. The fourth is networked uh, technologies. And the final one is cyber infrastructure. So we've seen a nuanced, much more complex uh, way in which we can communicate and collaborate. <clears throat> Affordances of technologies differ according to the technology, the context in use. And it's arguable that the internet has been the most disruptive technology in the last 50 years. It's amazing to think that it only emerged in the 90s. Now we couldn't imagine a world without it. Technologies can enable more interaction and communication. They can help us potentially fuse appropriately. They can be engaging and motivational. They can extend the classroom, and I'll come back to that in a moment. They can provide timely and targeted feedback. They can personalize and they can enable more open practices. Uh, in terms of um, the division between vir virtual and real, Mark Brown has a nice little slide um, which he refers to as uh, digital uh, learning ecology. And you've got the different um, quadrants there. You've got in school, out of class, out of school, out of class, uh, in school, in class, and out of school, in class. So you've got uh, a leakage between the real and uh, virtual, and there's very much a blurring of the boundaries. <clears throat> uh, in, uh, and I think this is referencing back, of course, to Andrea's talk. We've got the seminal report on opening up education, and I wanted to talk in particular around open practices in terms of OER MOOCs and e-text MOOCs. Um, we draw on the work of Catherine Cronin, who's now the National Forum uh, here in Ireland, and she talks about the use of open practices of complex, personalised and contextualised. And John Alcott uh, talks about a continuum of openness and access. <clears throat> so what's the impact? I'm going to talk about the impact at three levels in terms of learners, in terms of teachers and ter in terms of researchers. In terms of learners, they can interact with rich open educational resources. They can participate in massive open online courses, like learning at scale. And these are this is drawing on work here by my colleague, uh, Amy Costello, uh, looking at flexibility and cost effectiveness. And interestingly, in the work that he and colleagues have been doing, uh, students are interacting with e textbooks because they're cheap or they're free, not because of the increased interactivity they offer. Teachers uh, can have new approaches to design, and we come back to that. <coughs> And they can take MOOCs for continuing professional development. Research is now completely transformed by social media and the uh, ability to be part of an international global community of peers. And we see an opening up of digital scholarship. <coughs> uh, in a uh, conference I took part in last year, looked at the future of open uh, learning. And there's a link there to a blog post I wrote about it in terms of the key aspects. And these are some of the challenges I've identified. We have a lack of digital literacy to really make effective use of technologies. Technology is still, sadly, in most institutions, a poor system to research. We're seeing new forms of accreditation emerging, as we've heard in the talks today. We need senior management to understand technologies and uh, have buy-in to them. We need appropriate CPD, and we're seeing an unbundling of education where students in the future may not choose to take a three-year full-time degree, but may pay for particular components. Continuing professional development is vital, and this was a key message from the report that Mark and I did, did in particular the central role of the teacher uh, and the fact that CPD can enable teachers to be more innovative and make more effective use of digital technologies. And there's a variety of different formats which can be used for different purposes. And often, actually, just the sharing of good practice among practitioners is, is very effective. Um, my colleague Orna, who I think is still here uh, in the chat box, uh, is leading on a new initiative um, called Open Teach, which we're very, very excited about, which is funded by the National Forum. Uh, the National Forum, we draw on the quotes that they have. It's about empowering staff to create, discover, and engage in meaningful personal and professional development. We have about a 1,000 DCU-connected online students, and they're supported by 90 tutors across Ireland. And this initiative is aimed to create an online course which will help them more effectively support our online students. So we're going to have a number of modules 
We're going to look at open online pedagogy, online assessment and feedback, modes of enabling online teaching, effective student support, uh, ways to foster communication and collaboration, creating engaging contact and um, facilitating reflection. So we're literally just in the process of uh, interviewing uh, for a learning designer for that <clears throat> post that we're kicking off in April. So do keep an eye out for that. We'll certainly be tweeting lots about it uh, on social media. <clears throat> I've just mentioned some frameworks. Um, this is from uh, a chapter of a book I've just submitted to Rona Sharp and Helen Beetham's uh, third edition of Rethinking Pedagogy for a Digital Age. And in that chapter, I group learning design frameworks into three types. Frameworks for guiding the use of technology, uh, media, and materials. That's the SAMR um, framework, the sections framework, and the co op framework. Workshop approaches, such as the seven C's of learning design, uh, the HLM hybrid learning model, and uh, the very effective ABC learning design project um, inspired by Diana Lorillard's work. And approaches based on specific theory of learning engagement, and in particular, the ICAP framework. If you're interested in that chapter, do email me. I'd be happy to send you a draft copy of it. I'm just going to focus in on one of those, the seven Cs. Um, this consists of creating a vision for the course in terms of conceptualizing the course, four Cs to do with activities, creating resources, fostering communication and collaboration, and a considered C is to do with enabling reflection and uh, demonstration of achievement of learning outcomes, i.e. the assessment component. The combined C gets the designers to step back and look at the design from different perspectives. And finally, the consolidate C is about implementing and evaluating how effective the design is. So each of these Cs has associated with it a whole set of resources and activities. And I run lots of workshops um, on this. To complement learning design, I think learning analytics is very important, a real buzzword at the moment. It can be used by teachers to see what learners are doing, to identify what they're struggling with and support them, and provide targeted feedback. But learners can also see the patterns as they're learning. So it might say, you seem to be doing all your learning on a Sunday afternoon. Research shows it's better to do it in bite-sized chunks throughout the week, uh, so they can receive valuable feedback. They can compare their learners against their classmates. So you appear to have done four hours learning this week, your class weights on average are spending 10 hours. And they can set and review their learning goals. So still a bit of a buzzword, but I think learning analytics complemented with learning design is going to be very, very important and powerful uh, in the near future. So final reflections, again, going back to the report Mark and I wrote, uh, these were the kind of final reflections and recommendations we made. Firstly, that the digital learning ecology is complex and we need more research to understand it. The importance of affordances and understanding them. There's no single metaphor for 21st century learning, and support for learning needs to match learner needs and the context of learning. Assessment needs to support deep learning. We know assessment is a key driver. It needs to be purposeful and support active, authentic, and meaningful learning. And finally, Teachers' mindsets are really important. It doesn't matter how good the design is or how good the technology is, teachers matter most. But also leadership and the institutional culture is important and needs to be enabling of the use of technologies. And we need to change from looking at education in change to education for change. And the very final slide, change as a constant. Change isn't just one thing, just one time just one big revolution. Change occurs in stages and phases, which each adding depth, color, character, and creating a multi-dimensional you. This is a, a quote from uh, Winnie the Pooh. How does one become a butterfly, she asked. You must want to fly so much that you are willing to give up being a butterfly. So that's our final quote. And I just wanted to uh, blatantly promote um, the conference we're running here in November the World Conference on Online Learning, which is in the iconic uh, Dublin Conference Centre. Really recommend you come to that. It's going to be a fantastic um, event. So thanks for listening, and I think that's me done.
Thank you, Gradya. Great presentation, and all of our presenters. Um, I'd like to open the floor now to questions that you may have uh, for Gradya or for anyone else who presented today. Uh, we have some questions um, that were not answered. Uh, for example, for Elena, there was the question of, do you think open university libraries could play or have a role towards open edu education? Uh, and there was also one from for Andrea from Sh Sinead, who asked if open degrees sound, that, that she said that open degrees sound very interesting, and what do you think the funding model would be? So those are a couple of questions for our speakers. Perhaps, Eleni, you could start with that first question about whether you think open university libraries. Yes, of course. Uh, I really think uh, that uh, open access and open libraries will play a great role in open education because in, um, in there we can find the qualified the point to share qualified resources for a scholar and for higher education. So I really think that we, we play a great role for open education. Andrea, would you like to tackle the second question? Sure. Um, I tried and typed something on, on the chat. Um, basically, I think that um, talking about business models is really complicated because um, universities have their own way of seeing education, of receiving funding, depending on their national governments or so and so forth. But uh, the concept of open degree that I'm, I'm trying to present here is not depending, dependent upon any specific funding model or business model, more, but more about existing models and collaboration between universities. It's not a new thing. Just think back of the Open University UK. They've been offering open degrees for a very long time now. Um, you can have a degree. Open, this is the name of degree. What does this mean? It means that you have studied different subject areas, you have passed them all, you got credits for them all, but at the end of, of it, you don't have any specialization. You know, you have a number of different credits that you studied in different subject areas that together, due to your cognitive work and, and the amount of time you've put in it, you can be granted a degree. So an open degree can be an open degree with no specialization, but just showing that someone has gone through the, the cognitive process of higher education, or a, specializ a specialized degree no, in something in particular, like being a teacher, whatever that is, in which universities just have to come together and combine uh, and discuss their, their syllabi and discuss their credits uh, and discuss mutual recognition, which is an agenda that we are pushing forward heavily now with this council recommendation of mutual recognition of diplomas in higher education. And because we aim to create this European education area by 2020, and with this new initiative of the European universities, there is an opportunity now to tap into uh, all of this and create this model of degrees that is not really fighting against the official, official, not the traditional, because both of them would be official, but the traditional degrees is just a different way of studying in an alternative way for the, the task force or, or people to be able to reskill and upskill because there is a huge skills gap as the European Union nowadays. And open education has the potential to help us bridge that gap and also increase the digital competence of people. But then universities have to play a key role you know, on, on collaborating, promoting these degrees, and help people really improve their digital competence. But all to be defined. There is no specific model on this yet. OK. Thank you. Uh, there is a lot of chatter going on in the chat box at the moment uh, to a question that Irena posted. Uh, open science is still a complicated concept. Do you agree that we need more explainers and trainers on open science and open education? And I think this is not addressed to anyone specifically on, on the panel, but it, uh, anyone could answer it at this point. Who would like to? Nobody. Grania? just say that I, I think open science is, is really critical. And again, uh, as I mentioned in my talk, we've really opened up the research space by being part of a global community of peers. And there's huge opportunities for this. When I was um, a chemist back uh, way back when, 
we did some work at um, Southampton where we were opening up um, data directly to students and making it available. And that was, had a huge impact on the way the students were participating. So there's a lot more we can do to open up science. Irena, did you want to say something? Uh, yes, I think, you know, the, the complexity is that um, we, as, as Andrea mentioned, we, we've been working on, on the idea of open education uh, for, for many years already. And I think, you know, it always comes um, uh, to, to two ends, so to say. One is um, uh, the academics, the professionals, the teachers uh, who are working with it and try to realize, establish, create and then uh, practice uh, uh, open education uh, scenarios, whatever they may be. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, uh, the, the other one, the other side is actually the administration of the institution who always ask, re-ask and reinvent the questions again. What is the impact? What is the effect of, of open education? And now we have uh, great uh, practices, great uh, projects, uh, great pilots even uh, for open uh, collaboration of teachers, open uh, collaboration of institutions, um, students. Uh, but um, in order to mainstream, I think uh, the all, all types of effect uh, evidences are important. And this goes back to science. I think we need to research and to demonstrate uh, the impacts already reached. So uh, through digital competences, through collaboration. But now when we speak about open degree, I think this is a great chance for us uh, in line with the, the initiative of European University Networks and with other initiatives to demonstrate actually that uh, universities may create alliances, universities and other higher education and other institutions, they may create alliances and create their own models of learning. So we will not receive a solution or recipe. But I think this is a great opportunity. And uh, maybe this could be the talk uh, that also can be understood by administration. You know, when we go deep enough, into recognition uh, scenarios, into metadata, into infrastructure development. This is more like uh, operational side of, uh, uh, of already accepted uh, decisions. But what we also need to talk on the level of administration and policy makers and policy, um, uh, so policy decision also level, I, I, I think we, we sometimes are closer with them than, uh, than with the administration of universities and colleges. Andrea and Jochen, did you have uh, something that you would like to add to what Andrea, uh, what Arena has said? No, I don't. Andrea? It's the first time that I'm speaking in public, not the second, about open degrees. <laughs> and it's interesting to see the reactions. Uh, this is an idea that uh, we've started presenting to Director General Education and Culture. We were about to start a project on it, and we decided to step back because there's so, there are so many things in the agenda. But I'm hoping that we'll be able to get back to it at some point. But in any case, I thought it was you know, in line with this idea of sharing with the open education movement that I could already share with you <laughs> that this is something that we'd like to see happening. And maybe you also come up with ideas and help us build the momentum to, to see what you can do about it. Now, of course, uh, someone mentioned before about costs. Of course, I mean, this, this conversation about costs has always happened in open education. Yes, but we are not talking about something to replace traditional education systems, but something to go alongside with it. So if we create MOOCs, and we already create MOOCs, uh, maybe we could charge for uh, assessment. This is something we discussed so much in the Open Credit Report, which Grania participated in. No? Uh, maybe we could charge for the actual certification. So there has to be other models that we need to 
think about and jointly discuss and, and decide upon. Uh, but there are possibilities, you know. Uh, but it's all about collaboration. So now here, here comes the, the main challenge. How can we actually collaborate in the line, you know, our frameworks, you know, our requirements, our national requirements, and how can we jointly make those things happen? So it's challenging, but it's not impossible. Thank you, Andrea. We have uh, just a minute left, so what I'd like to do is wrap up um, before we end. Thank our speakers for giving very excellent uh, presentations today. Really enjoyed hearing about the different projects from, uh, you know, using Learner Passport to prior learning from Yelkin on the OE Pass and from Raymond about recognizing the micro-credentials with the micro-HE project and then Irena's uh, talk about uh, reopen and informal and non-formal learning. Uh, re and really about refining and redefining openness. Um, and Elena really enjoyed uh, your look at how open education in Italy, uh, what the key drivers are, open education resources and practices, MOOCs, open access, uh, and the kinds of best practices and rules that you're looking at within, within Italy and for higher education institutions. Andrea, we're all looking forward to hearing about the upcoming publication from the EC, getting, getting our hands on that from the Joint Research Center. Uh, just to put in another plug for that, Modernizing Higher Education um, uh, for Practitioners, um, open, and educational, uh, open Educational Practices. And then finally, thank you, Grania, for giving us your reflections and your insights and your thoughts about the open ed education movement, where we've been, uh, and the direction that we're moving in right now. Uh, and, uh, and thank you uh, for the Secretariat for your support during this, um, during this presentation. And of course, all of the participants who came today uh, to listen to our presenters, to hear about the projects, to hear about some of the initiatives that are happening within the EU around openness. Um, I'd like to remind you that we have a couple more sessions coming up uh, over the next two days. Uh, in for Open Education Week uh, tomorrow and on Friday. So uh, if you're interested in more topics on open research, open education, please be sure um, to sign up for those. The recordings will be available on the um, Eden website. So if you weren't able to attend the entire session or would like to see, see uh, the session again, uh, please be sure to check on the uh, Eden website. And finally, um, I would like to remind everyone, as Grania did with ICDE, uh, we have, uh, and, and the Dublin conference coming up, we also have a conference coming up this summer uh, with Eden, which is in, going to be in Bruges. Um, and we hope that we will see you there in person. And thank you for everyone for coming again and our presenters.